Hey, what's going on everybody? This is Nick from Part-Time Pilot doing another video. This one's going to be on plotting your cross-country course. My last video was on performing the weight and balance for your aircraft. This is part of the cross-country checklist. So after you've performed your weight and balance, the next thing you want to do is get to plotting your cross-country course. So this video, I'm going to use an example from Gillespie Field, KSEE -E, in Southern California near San Diego to Apple Valley, KAPV which is also in Southern California, just east of LA, out near the uh, Mojave Desert. So step one in plotting your course is you wanna draw a straight line course from the departure airport to your destination airport. Okay, so here we are on ForeFlight. We have the California chart in, and if you click up here on the flight plan, you can just enter the airports, and it will draw you a straight line course. Okay, so we have Gillespie Field down here and Apple Valley all the way up here. So this is our straight line course and step one is complete. So coming back to our checklist, we can move on to step two, which is determining our checkpoints. So now that we have a straight line course, we can look at it, we can follow it very closely and keep an eye out for any terrain and airspaces that we may want to avoid. Then we will add checkpoints to avoid these places from anywhere about 10 to 20 miles from one checkpoint to the next. And we'll make them uh, near prominent locations that are easy to distinguish from the air. Stuff like lakes, dams, golf courses, cities, airports, stuff like that. And we want to try and make it the most direct and risk-free route as possible. Starting here at Gillespie Field, we will zoom in and if you can see, we immediately right here have a Class Bravo airspace that we got to deal with. As a student pilot, you, if you are going to solo on a cross country for this flight, you would need a Class Bravo endorsement, okay? So if you didn't have a Class Bravo endorsement, you would have to completely avoid this Class Bravo. If you did, you can go ahead and fly through it if you get clearance. Now, to get clearance, you're gonna have to request clearance from flight following, but it's not a guarantee that they will give it to you. And since this Bravo is so close, I mean, we're already underneath the Bravo right here. As you can see, this starts at 4,800 and goes up to 10,000 feet. So we're beneath the 4,800 Bravo right away but if we fly in this straight direction it's only it starts at 1800 so we won't be able to climb very high and we need to climb to avoid terrain anyways so since it happened we run into this 1800 foot starting Bravo pretty soon we won't have that much time to talk to flight following and in the scenario where they don't give us Bravo clearance we're gonna want to have to plan for that so instead of going straight on out what I would do is I would come over here and there's a nice little lake right here that we can fly to and this can kind of be our give us some time to talk to flight following get Bravo clearance and if we don't get Bravo clearance now we're flying through this class Bravo these two class Bravos that start one starts at 3,800 and one start, starts at 4,800 and looking at the terrain around here we'll be able to fly above the train and still be below this class Bravo if we do not get the clearance. Okay, so we're gonna fly to Lake Jennings here, and then we're going to turn north and continue to climb, but stay under our class Bravo. Now, the next thing we're going to encounter is this class Delta airspace, this uh, dash blue circle that surrounds KRNM or Ramona Airport. So here, this 38 tells us that the class Delta goes up to 3,800 feet. So if we are underneath our class Bravo that starts at 3,800, we will definitely be flying into this class Delta. So we go back to Lake Jennings. Now, if we're calling flight following and we don't get class Bravo clearance, we know that we're going to have to stay below 3,800 and we are going to fly into the class Delta airspace. So 
Lake Jennings is our decision point. If we don't have Class Bravo clearance, then we are going to have to call Ramona KRNM and ask for transition through their Class Delta. If we do have Class Bravo clearance, we can climb up into the Class Bravo and up over the 3800 ceiling of the Class Delta at Ramona. Either way, Ramona Airport is a good uh, checkpoint. And if you click here, it says 11 nautical miles away. So that's a good checkpoint. Now, if we move along, things get uh, a lot less congested as we move north. Um, the next thing we run into is these mountains here, this brown area here. As you can see, there's a peak over here at 6,140. You got a peak here at 5,680. And then we fly right now directly over a peak at 4,779. So, uh, when we choose our cruise altitude, we might be above this, uh, but it's smart to avoid it. And right in here, if we want to make a checkpoint every 10 to 20 nautical miles, we're going to want to make another checkpoint. So let's just make it right here above this private airport, which is a good visual. And that brings us to the left a bit, and we'll be able to slide past uh, these mountains. Okay, so moving on, we'll fly past just to the left of these mountains. So we have French Valley Airport, we have Billy Joe Private down here, French Valley, or we have the Skinner Reservoir. I'm going to use the edge of this reservoir just to the left, just to push us a little bit more to the left and pass these mountains here. So as we move up, uh, looking for our next checkpoint, we see this magenta solid lines, which signify a Class Charlie airport airspace around KRIV which is Riverside so we're going to fly through the portion that starts at 3,900 and ends at 5,500 so if we are above 5,500 we're good and we have a good uh, waypoint right here uh, Cedar which is a nav waypoint the intersection of two VORs so that's something good and it's also right next to this lake here it, which is a good visual and it's about 19 miles from our last checkpoint so moving on to the north we fly over uh, redlands municipal um, towns nothing nothing to avoid here no air spaces until we get up here into the brown and we get a uh, much higher terrain so going to be traveling directly over some there's a peak at 4743 uh, we have a peak over here of 6,153, although we're not very close to it. And then we got some 6,000 foot lines over here, if you follow these, like right in here. So I would say we want to at least be above 6,153, so we'll get to that. Uh, we're not going to be able to fly around these peaks, uh, we're just going to have to fly above them. So we can make a, another checkpoint above Lake Arrowhead which is a good visual just to the side of Lake Arrowhead so if we continue on north we leg of our flight would be 19 nautical miles so there's no need for any more checkpoints unless of course we need to move to have a smooth descent uh, it's not interrupted by any terrain so if we look we're gonna fly right over 4948 foot peak we need to descend to Apple Valley, which is 3,062 feet. So keeping that in mind, we're gonna have to descend a little bit and we may not wanna descend right over this peak. So what we can do is if you look right here to the left, we have this Mojave River, which is kind of a valley. And so if we just make a checkpoint right over here, it's a good visual. We can fly to the right of this peak at 5,737 and to the left of this peak at 4,948 into this valley and we will have an unobstructed descent into Apple Valley and we will avoid any of the high terrain over here and behind it with the windmills and over here with these high trains and peaks and windmills as well. We'll come straight through this valley they deem Apple Valley. So that does it for our checkpoints. If we zoom out, we can see that we kept a pretty straight course, didn't have to deviate too much, which is good 
economically for our fuel usage and as well as the time and route. So the next thing we got to do is determine the cruise altitude. Now we already discussed this a little bit, but let's go back to four flight. Okay, so if we start again at the beginning, we know that we got to stay below 3,800 for the Bravo. But once we are clear of that, we'll be able to climb to our cruise altitude. And the only obstacles we have are right here. We are flying just left of this peak at 4,360. But it's probably smart to stay above this anyways. So if we continue on, we're not going to have any other terrain except we do have this class Charlie that we have to deal with. So this class Charlie ends at 5,500. So we're going to want to be above 5,500. So that now puts our highest point we have to clear at 5,500. And moving on... We're not going to have any other terrain until we get to here, which is we fly over a 4,743-foot terrain, and then we fly over some higher terrain, which has a peak at 6,153. So to be safe, we can fly over 6,153. We should be good, at least 500 feet above that. So now the next thing we have to de determine is the hemispherical rule. If we're flying between 0 and 180, we have to be an odd thousand plus 500, so like 3,500 or 5,500. If we're flying on a heading of 181 to 360 or Easter, or westerly heading, then we need to fly an even thousand plus 500. So let's look at our course. So in four flight, you can just click the leg and it'll tell you the course. So this first one is 334, so that's a westerly heading. 336, westerly. I think these are all going to be westerly. 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 And easterly. But this last one will be during our descent, which the hemispherical rule only applies for cruise. So when we're descending, we are obviously going descending altitudes. We don't have to obey the hemispherical rule. So we're good. All our crew's legs are westerly. And so we know that it has to be an even 1,000 plus 500. So the first uh, candidate is 6,500. That would put us above, about 350 feet above this peak here. I would play it safe and just choose a cruise altitude of 8,500. The final and fourth step is determining true courses and distances to each checkpoint. Now, if you have four flight, that was pretty easy. You just click on the leg. It's going to tell you your distance to each checkpoint and the course. Now, this course has an M by it, which means magnetic. So it's not a true course. It's a magnetic course. That means four flight has already calculated our variation out of the course so uh, it's taken the true course and it subtracted the ice subtracted or added the isogonic line to correct for variation and give us a magnetic course now if you don't have four flight you're gonna need to get out your chart and do it the old school way so you're gonna need your chart and plotter so what you're gonna do is you're gonna line up your plotter line so you have multiple lines you can use on your plotter you have this edge here you have this edge here, or you have the center line in the transparent area in the middle of your plotter. I like to use this top edge up here. So what I do is I align that top edge with the leg of my flight that I am determining the true course for. So from one checkpoint to the other, that's the leg. I line that up parallel and snug against the edge of this plotter. And then now I can spin this wheel until I get zero pointing straight up. So I want zero pointing straight up and I want these vertical lines on the wheel, highlighted here in blue, to be par parallel to the vertical lines on the chart. And then similarly, I want the horizontal lines to be parallel with the horizontal lines on the chart. So this lines up your wheel with the chart once that happens, you have your plotter lined up with your course, you have 
your wheel lined up with the chart and now the intersection of the two will tell you your true course so here in this example you can see that the, between 310 and 320 if you look closely it's about 317 so a true course of 317 so you're gonna need to do that for each checkpoint and then you're gonna need to measure the distance also with your plotter from one checkpoint to the next for each leg so to do that your plotter has distance markings on the sides it also has it on the other side now the only trick to this is you want to make sure that these different scales that you're using the right scale for the chart you're using okay so if you want nautical miles and you're using a sectional chart you're gonna have one of these lines and then if you want statute miles on a sectional chart you're gonna use another one of these lines and there's four total there's a terminal area chart and sectional chart and nautical and statute miles so there's four combinations so there's four different scales make sure you're using the right scale likely you're going to use the sectional chart with nautical miles scale Okay, so that's been how to plot your course, start your cross-country planning. Stay tuned for the next video as we march on through the cross-country checklist. We're going to cover everything on that checklist so that you'll have a video for every part of planning your cross-country. And so there's no confusion on how to plan a cross-country. And you can ensure that you'll do that with 100% accuracy. As always, please follow me at, on Instagram at part period time period pilot. And then subscribe to my YouTube channel. Right now I'm giving away a free study guide, which is all my slides and stuff that I make these all out of. I put into a study guide, which is really great to study for your written or your check rides. You can have these slides. You can have a friend quiz you. And it's, it's just a great study tool to have on your phone, your iPad, computer, or print them off. And so just send me a message on Instagram. Be sure to follow and subscribe. And I hope you guys have a great day.